Welcome. I'm Michael Singer, and I'm meeting you today in Temple of the Universe, a place that has been a sanctuary for yoga for over 40 years. You'll see around me the photos of many great yogic masters, including my preceptor, Paramahansa Yogananda. It's a very fitting setting because I'm honored to have been asked today to speak to you about yoga and how it relates to my best-selling book, The Untethered Soul. To begin with, let's take a look at what yoga is. The science of yoga has been called many, many different things, and like most sciences, it can be very complicated and you can get very lost in it. But the truth of the matter is yoga is very, very simple. Yogananda once said, yoga is the science of self-realization. That's the simplest way to look at it. The way the untethered soul starts off is in essence to look you in the eyes and ask you a very simple question. Are you in there? Are you in there? And anyone I ever asked it to said, yeah, I'm in here. And the question then becomes, how do you know? How do you know you're in there? And eventually after getting frustrated with me, you'll yell at me and say, because I hear you, because I'm aware of what you're talking about. I'm in here. Oh, well, that's yoga. Just as physics tries to understand gravity, understand where things came from, yoga tries to understand who is in there. Who are you? Where did you come from? How are you doing in there? That's the second question. How are you doing in there? Honestly. And what most people will answer you is, well, sometimes it's okay, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's very difficult to be in here, and sometimes very pleasant to be in here. That is what the science of yoga is about. It's really beautiful. In the West, we've studied many, many different things. Yoga comes from thousands of years of very, very great beings stepping aside for a moment and devoting their lives to the question of, who am I? Where do I come from? Why is it difficult in here sometimes? And why is it not? Science is about, excuse me, the yoga of science is about you. So let's start answering those questions because that is the question that the untethered soul takes on. What's it like in there? And like I said, most people will say it varies. It varies on what? And so you say, well, if it's my birthday and I plan to party outside and it's pouring rain, it's not okay in here. It's less than not okay in here. It's very, very difficult in here. But if I just planted a garden and it's pouring rain, I'm, I'm joyous. I feel wonderful inside. My garden's going to grow. This is very good. And so you start to realize there's something fishy going on in here. Why would I be okay one time when it's raining and I'm not okay in here another time when it's raining? And to cut to the chase, you realize it's something you're doing. When you want it to rain, you're fine in there. When you don't want it to rain, you're not fine in there. When someone you like comes up here, comes up to you, and talks to you and says some things nice to you, you feel good. When someone you don't want to interact with at all, you're not comfortable with at all, comes up and even says nice things, you're very uncomfortable. This is what the untethered soul talks about. What are you doing in there that is making it so complicated that life is having this very difficult and, and, and uncomfortable effect on you or having a very nice effect on you? And eventually what you will see is that you have developed inside yourself concepts of like and dislike. They're not part of your genes. They're not part of uh, anything you inherited. They're just experiences you've had over the course of your life that left impressions on you. In yoga, we call them some scars, which either felt good or didn't feel good. And you store those inside your mind. And now when events take place outside, they hit that stuff, and either you feel comfortable or you feel uncomfortable. That's it. We could talk about it for days, and maybe it'd be good to, but that's the bottom line, is that you decided inside your mind what you like and what you don't like. And when the world unfolds, it either matches and you feel good, or it doesn't match and you feel really bad. And if it really doesn't match, you feel really, really bad. So this is the starting point of life, of yoga, and of the book, The Untethered Soul. 
So what you start to see is the more things you have inside yourself that are about what you like and what you don't like, the more difficulty you have with life. So because it's uncomfortable, it's very natural you don't want it to be uncomfortable in there. So what you do is you try to fix it. But you fix it based on your likes and dislikes. You don't fix your likes and dislikes. You keep those. You fix what is going on in the world, or at least you try to, fix what is going on in the world so that it matches your likes and dislikes. That begins with your mind trying to figure out how everything needs to be, everybody and everything, including the weather, how it needs to be in order for you to be okay inside. And if that's not complicated enough, figuring all that out, you then tell your mind to figure out how to make it be that way. And most people's lives are about that. They are about the foundation is what they like and dislike. And then the first layer of mind is figuring out how everything needs to be past, present, and future in order for them to be comfortable with how things were, are, and will be. And then they set about trying to make it be that way. Yoga is the antithesis of that. Antithesis of that. Yoga says very clearly, if you want to be okay in there, you need to start with accepting reality. You need to start with being able to look outside your eyes, see the world, and be comfortable. Doesn't mean you don't do anything about it. Doesn't mean you don't try to raise it. But your starting position is, I am in here. The world is out there. It is unfolding in accordance to science, in accordance to the will of God, however you want to look at it. But it is not unfolding in accordance to me. I am not the creator of the universe. It's been here for 13.8 billion years, and it created everything that's around me. If I pit what I like and what I dislike against the reality of the unfolding world, no wonder there's so much tension. No wonder there's so much disturbance, so much anxiety, and so much suffering. If, on the other hand, I learn to come to peace within myself and just be comfortable being in here, and then I look outside and I'm fascinated by, just honored to be experiencing the reality that's unfolding in front of me, all of a sudden life becomes beautiful. Life becomes peaceful. All of life can be an exciting experience of love and of expression and of passion and inspiration. But it's not going to be that way if the only way you're okay is if the world matches what you want and what you don't want. That is the foundation of yoga, and that is the foundation of the book, The Untethered Soul. That's the starting position. Which way do you want to go with your life? Do you want to continue fighting with the world and trying to make it match what you think should be going on based on your likes and dislikes? Or do you want to come into harmony with reality? Very much what Lao Tzu talked about in the Tao. Do you want to come into harmony with the reality that's unfolding in front of you so you can participate in life and raise it? Do beauty by all means. Bring love, bring beauty to it. But not the starting position. I'm not okay. And this is how the world needs to be for me to be okay. That is the antithesis of yoga. Yoga is about harmonizing, merging with all of reality. So once you catch on with that, the question becomes, how do you do this? Because so far what we've talked about does not sound like traditional yoga. Traditional yoga sounds like body exercises, asanas. Sounds like meditation. Sounds like going to India and climbing the Himalayas and finding a great master. It sounds like doing mantra, doing meditation. Every one of those things are techniques that great yogis have devised and discovered that will help you come to peace within yourself. They are not yoga. No more than a calculator or a slide rule or a computer is mathematics. They are tools that are used in order to achieve the purpose of yoga. So looking more traditionally at the tool, so why would meditation work? What's meditation got to do with me who's in here and struggling with myself? Meditation is very, very simple in the simplest sense. The simplest meditation nowadays that's taught is 15 minutes in the morning, 15 at night, sit down and watch your breath go in and out. Well, what's so holy about watching your breath go in and out? What's that got to do with yoga? If you are watching your breath go in and out, you are not watching your mind complain about what's going on. You're not letting your mind, you're not watching the mind 
that is participating in the game of what do I want, what do I not want, and how do I make it happen. You are instead focusing your awareness on the breath going in and out. Believe it or not, that will completely change your life. Why? For the very reason that you're not participating in the disturbed mind. The mind will always be disturbed if the foundation of the mind is what do I want, what do I not want, and how do I make it happen? That is very disturbing because you have pitted yourself against the unfolding of reality in front of you. People actually are still disturbed about things that happened in the past. That's, that's the one when I realized that, that I said, I'm moving out to the woods to get my head together. Like, the past already happened. You're not going to change the past. So if I'm not okay with the past because I didn't like it or because I did like it and it went away, I'm going to suffer for the rest of my life because I can't change the past. So you come to the point where you understand you have some work to do, and that work is yoga. That whole action of body of, where you're working on yourself is the science of yoga. So let's get back to meditation. If you watch your breath go in and out or any other technique of meditation, you use whatever is comfortable to you, it works for you. If you're watching your breath go in and out, you're not watching your mind live your life, decide what should be happening, and getting upset or excited about it. That very act of not watching the disturbed mind permits you, you in there, the one that I said, are you in there? Hi. You're in there, but you're watching your mind all the time and participating in the mind's attempt to make things be the way it wants. A yogi doesn't do that. A yogi, for example, watches their breath go in and out and lets go of the mind. You don't fight with the mind. It's not about shutting the mind up. The mind talks now because you told it to. You gave your mind a job. You said, oh mind, brilliant mind. You have such a brilliant mind. Don't figure out how to make air conditioning work. Don't figure out about the quantum field. Don't figure out how to make rocket ships that fly to the moon. I want you to figure out how everybody and everything around me needs to be for me to be okay. We call that the personal mind. You did that. You asked your mind to do that. So now your mind says, yes, I'll do that day and night. Can't fall asleep all day. That's what it's thinking about in the background. So yoga is about not participating, not fighting, but not participating in the personal mind. Realizing I don't want to play the game of what do I want and what do I not want and how to make it happen. I want to start off by being at peace within myself and honoring and respecting the realities unfolding in front of me doesn't mean I can't change it. But if you're going to change something, you have to start by honoring and respecting its existence, come in harmony with it, and then see what you can do about it. You're not going to change it by complaining about it. So basically, a yogi learns to come into quietude within the seat of their own self. And you can only do that when you're ready, willing, and able to let the personal mind pass by, which is not difficult. People make it difficult. Just put your consciousness elsewhere. For example, on your breath. Just watch that instead of watching your mind. What happens from that point forward is nothing short of miraculous. The very act of not being addicted to the personal mind permits you to come to peace within yourself. And somehow it seems like the world becomes a nicer place. The truth is, you become a nicer person. You come from a nicer place when you look at the world. So all of a sudden, the rain looks beautiful. All the rain. Yeah, sure, you wanted to have a party. So what? doesn't matter. You didn't need the party so you could become popular, so the people would like you, because you're already at peace within yourself. So therefore, if it rains on the party, you have fun getting wet, or you have fun running inside and doing something else. You don't complain. It's not a problem, because you're already okay. Yoga is about being okay inside. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says to Arjuna, equanimity is yoga. Equanimity is yoga. What does that mean? It means you're at peace within yourself regardless of what is going on outside. Again, it doesn't mean you don't interact with it. It doesn't mean you don't raise it, help it, change it. It means you start by accepting the past because it's already over, and you then accept the reality that's unfolding in front of you so that you're quiet and clear enough to be able to interact with it, to do some good. So this is the essence of yoga. Yes, meditation is very, very helpful. 
If it helps you, meditate. Mantra, another thing. That's a foundation of yoga. Why? What's so great about mantra? If you teach your mind to say a word over and over again, name of God, I used to just say God, 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 so I have to worry about what name I said. But it doesn't have to be God, whatever it is. If you teach your mind to say this habitually over and over, then when your mind starts to say other things, you've given yourself, your consciousness, the choice of paying attention to the mantra or paying attention to all the disturbance that the mind is creating because it's not getting what it wants. So all of a sudden, somebody doesn't say hello to you. They walk by and don't say hello. You don't know why, you know, if they didn't see you, you don't know anything. Well, your mind goes crazy. What did I do? What's wrong with them? Oh my God, maybe they're mad at me. Instead, God, God, God. That's yoga. So the power of meditation, the power of mantra, all of these techniques are about taking your consciousness off of the disturbed mind and putting it on something much calmer, much more steady. And what you will find if you learn to do that, eventually something very great will happen. You will find that the mind cannot distract your consciousness anymore. You don't have to fight with it. You just know it doesn't know what it's talking about. It's just left over. It's not helping you. You don't need that. Not your intellectual mind, your analytical mind. That's you using your mind to do math. You using your mind to logic something out. It is the mind that happens automatically because it's trying to solve the habitual question. How do I be okay? How do I get what I want? How do I avoid what I don't want? That's the mind. We call it the personal mind that yoga is all about. That yoga is about transcending that mind. So basically what happens when you learn not to pay attention to your mind, and that's the highest yoga. You have to fight with your mind. You have to fight with the world. You're in there. Are you comfortable being in there when the world is unfolding and your mind's trying to say something about it? You just relax. You relax behind it and lean away from the noise the mind is making. If you want to put your attention elsewhere, like for example, here's a great yogic technique. Eventually you will find that there is a pressure, a pull at the point between your eyebrows. As you grow, it gets stronger and stronger. It's, it's a technique of yoga to just raise your eyes to the point between your eyebrows and you will find that you grow tremendously and tremendous peace comes over you. Well, why does that happen? Because you're not watching your mind. You're watching something other than your mind. You're watching the flow of energy come to the point between your eyebrows. We call the third eye. All the techniques of yoga are about transcending the personal mind coming to peace with what's unfolding in front of you and maintaining what we call becoming established in the seat of self where you're in there being aware that you are aware and you're aware that there is a mind that is reacting some to the world that is unfolding but you're not participating in that. You're keeping yourself centered. Once that happens, some amazing things are going to happen which most people are are familiar with in the terms of yoga. Because you are not participating in your personal mind, eventually you'll start to realize that more and more of your awareness and consciousness remains centered within the seat of your being. Hope that doesn't sound like big words, it just means you're always aware that you're aware that you're aware. You're aware that the mind is talking, if it is, you're aware that the heart is feeling one thing or another, and you're aware that the world is unfolding in front of you. You're not reacting to it. You're not participating in the mind's reaction. You're just aware that all this is going on. When you become comfortable sitting in that seat, you will start to realize that you become aware of the nature of your own being. That's yoga. You literally, you have a nature too. The mind has a nature. We talked about that. The world has a nature. It's always unfolding, expressing the laws of nature. Your heart has a nature. It expresses and reacts to the different things that are unfolding, your human heart. Well, you also have a nature, the self, the Atman, soul. It has a nature, but you can't know it because you're busy watching the mind. If you're studying something else's nature, then that's what you're studying. If you're no longer studying the nature of the mind, the heart, or the world, your consciousness will naturally become aware of the nature of your own being. 
And that is something very, very great. You will realize that there's something going on inside of you that is more beautiful than anything you've ever experienced ever in your entire life. In fact, the source of any beauty you ever felt, any love you ever felt, was because the mind shut up for a minute and you opened and you were able to experience the greatness of your own being. That goes for love, that goes for joy, that goes for everything. All of it is coming from inside of you, but you can't experience it because you're experiencing the disturbances of mind and of heart. So as you start to experience the seat of your own self, all of a sudden you feel this tremendous energy flow wells up deep within you, not in front of you where you look at your mind or look at your heart or look out at the world, but back behind you, back behind where you sit inside. And it starts to pull you back into it. Now you start hearing the more traditional aspects of yoga. We call that energy flow Shakti. And eventually that word will become the most holy, sacred, beautiful word to you. It won't be something you study or read about. It will be more real to you than the beat of your heart. Be more real to you than the noise of your mind or of the world that's unfolding in front of you. It keeps rising up and pulling you into it. And its ecstasy, its joy, its beauty is so great that eventually you can't hold yourself back. Your meditations become spontaneous. They're not something you do. They're something that happened to you. All of your life now is saturated and permeated with this overwhelming sense of joy, of ecstasy. Then it pulls you in deeper. And eventually you start to get this inner sense of where is this coming from? Where does the flow of the Shakti come from? And the seeking of the source of that energy flow is your final stages in yoga. Yoga means union. It means when you let go enough of the pull of mind, the distraction, not the pull, the distraction of mind, the distraction of the human heart, and the distraction of what's coming in through your senses, when the pull of the Shakti inwardly is so strong that you can't resist it any longer, you just let go. It's the ultimate surrender. You let go, and it pulls you back into it. And the great masters, Christ, Buddha, all the great masters, saints and sages of all times and all religions, taught you the same thing. Eventually, the little river of your consciousness gets pulled back into the ocean of God. That's yoga. Yoga means union. That is the purpose of the book, The Untethered Soul. That is what it means to untether your soul. It is no longer tied to the humanness of your mind, the limitations of your heart, or to the temporal nature of what is unfolding in front of you. Once that takes place, you still live in this world, but the center of your being is merged into something much greater. You're a blessing on this earth. Your very presence brings love. It brings Shakti, brings God to anything you look at, anything that comes out of your mouth, any place you go. You're a blessing on this earth. Yoga is a very, very great thing. So the purpose of the writing of the untethered soul is to start at the beginning. How you doing in there? And work your way out back to the true nature of your own being. This is self-realization. This is yoga. Thank you.